summer with Helena. Thank you for the introduction, Melissa. Okay. All right. So just to check, can everyone see my screen? Can you see my uh, slides? Yes, looks good. All right, great. Thank you. So uh, today I want to talk about uh, diversifying pronunciation tasks. And often as teachers, we're very busy. Um, and so it, it's hard for us to, to make extra time to do extra things. And so I, I wanted to share some quick and easy inclusive extensions for teachers. And I won't just talk about extensions. Uh, extensions. I'll also talk about some inventions and some learner creations. And partway through the uh, presentation today, at three different points, uh, we're going to use Mentimeter um, for anyone who's used that tool before. So if you'd like, um, you can uh, prepare by getting the Mentimeter website up on, on your device uh, and uh, you'll receive a code to input. Uh, but there will also be links, I think, in the chat and there'll be QR codes as well. Alternatively, if uh, you're not able to use Mentimeter, if you're just in Zoom or just watching on, on Facebook and you want to type in the comments, that's fine. And I'll try to follow along the comments. Okay, everyone? All right. So meet me. It's nice to meet you all. In the previous session, uh, Peter talked about uh, inclusive pronouns, inclusive titles. So you can officially say that you have heard uh, a non-binary person whose title is Mix. Mix. Uh, that's me. Uh, so I'm a non-binary person. Uh, and since uh, non-binary is quite long, it has four syllables. I, we sometimes just say NB because uh, it's only two. Um, and I'm, I'm a pretty, my gender is expressed quite androgynously. Um, and I was assigned female at birth, AFAB, we say. Um, but, you know, as I've grown up, I've come to realize that I'm, you know, not a man, not a woman. I'm non-binary, somewhere in the middle. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's me. And uh, a little more about me, uh, just to usualize a bit. This is my partner, Adam. Uh, and uh, he and I have been together for f five years. It'll be the end of this year. Ooh, a long time. Um, and uh, so uh, I always say that I am what we call demi-romantic. So I'm uh, romantically attached to people based on my feelings and my relationship length with them. So if Adam was an Amanda, I would still be in love with Amanda. That doesn't really matter to me. I know that that word will be new to quite a lot of you. That's great. If you are interested in looking up more about different types of uh, LGBTQIA plus identities and, and people, uh, feel free to do that. There's a ton, plethora of resources out there. You got a bit of a hint of it from Peter's webinar earlier. Yeah. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about me, the timeline of my development, and I'm going to focus specifically on how I developed in pronunciation and how I developed in diversity and inclusion, or DNI, as we call it sometimes. Uh, and I'll give some examples of diverse and inclusive pronunciation tasks that I've I've tried to do. Um, and for those who've attended multiple webinars today, keep in mind a lot of the um, ideas you got from your other um, webinars. And don't just think about the things that I'm saying. Think about other ideas you can bring in from those. Okay, all types of inclusion and diversity are welcome in this webinar. And uh, we'll work on some ideas. I'll ask you to, to generate some ideas that you could use in your own classroom. And um, we'll do that on Mentimeter and in the in the chat. And then we'll hopefully have some time at the end for a Q&A, OK? So to start, and for those who did do the pre-webinar task, uh, this next bit you'll have already thought about. When we think about pronunciation, what do we think? What is pronunciation? So I'm uh, keeping an eye on the chat. So if I say pronunciation, what do you think of? Sounds, individual words and phrases, yep. How to say a word orally, the way we say words, yep. Articulation, the way we say things, the way we emit sounds, great. Lots of people with sounds, yeah, absolutely. Intonation, great. Phonemes, yep. Uttering words correctly, accents, products of sounds, intonation, syllables and stress. Yeah, great. Well done. Absolutely. Lots of great ideas. Super. How we articulate. Yeah, great. Thank you all. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. Stress and sounds. Yeah, well done. Uh, often when we think about it, pronunciation, we sometimes only think about phonemes and individual sounds and correcting those sounds at diphthongs and vowels. Nice. Well done. And how those sounds are different. But we should also think about, as people have suggested, stress, intonation, uh, word stress and sentence stress. 
um, connected speech when we speak quickly and our words blend together when when letters are assimilated or you know or we insert sounds things like that okay great what about diversity and inclusion if we think about yes zor accent and dialect nice when we think about diversity and inclusion what comes to mind if i say dni diversity and inclusion we think about diversity and inclusion in the elt classroom what do we think of then Personality, yep, representing all, identity, great. Uh, accepting, yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, culture, absolutely. Voice, yeah, community, learner styles, different groups, absolutely. Uh, different accents from different countries, yep, absolutely, good. Uh, including all people, very nice, Shirley. Learner's preferences, thank you. Great. English is, that's right, Ben. Who's English? Which English? Um, global English is. A peaceful atmosphere, right, Sandra? Multiple Englishes. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, formal and informal, right? Good. Could, could formal language be exclusive rather than inclusive? You know, what's, what, what, what's the register of our group? Right? Good. Well done. Right. Nice, everyone. Uh, anything else you can think of? Oh, ability and possibility. Yep. Hearing all the voices in class as much as possible, their ideas, their beliefs, communication, neurodivergence, being friendly to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Well done, everyone. Great. Super. Um, and so we, we would think about vocalization, leaving no one out. Lovely, Shirley. Yeah, I like that. Okay, good. We could, we could go talk about DNI forever, couldn't we? Um, and we've already had three webinars which have talked about different types of DNI as well. So, so, um, yeah, English spoken by different races, so different regional dialects or localized dialects, like different areas have different different dialects and accents of a language. Nice. So think for a moment, are you happy with these in your teaching? So if you're happy with the amount of pronunciation that you teach and how confident you feel about it, put a P in the chat. If you're not happy with it, don't put the P. Okay, same with DNI. If you think you know, my lessons are diverse and inclusive, type D and I in the chat. But if they're not, don't put it. And if you think you're happy with both, you think that your, les your lessons have pronunciation and they're inclusive and diverse, then write both. But if you think both of these are really difficult for me, then write neither. Let me know what you're thinking about these two topics in your chat. Ah, uh, great. Trevi feels confident about D and I. Uh-huh. Both. Some both neithers. Feeling, some people feel confident about DNI. People feeling confident about both. Good. Well done. I'm happy to hear that. I feel happy and confident about both, but I also know where we're always learning, right? Um, well, that's what my shirt says, right? It says never stop learning. <laughs> both, both, both. Great. Lots of both. Someone feeling confident about pronunciation. Great. Well done. Nice. Great to see. Yeah, it's okay to be confident in one and not the other or in both or in neither, you know, we're all at different stages in our in our learning journey, getting there I like that Shirley yeah ongoing learning hard but interesting and complex worth nice. All right, great well done everyone, thank you. It's good to get your input so. I want to talk about me and my learning journey and pronunciation and DNI uh, when I started teaching years ago, um, I was very unaware and uneducated about both topics, about pronunciation and about DNI. and i um, And, you know, as time progressed and I studied and learned and practiced and became more educated, I became more aware, but I was still unsure, lacking in confidence. You know, I needed practice. Um, and as time carried on, I was self-educating, practicing and building up my confidence in both of these topics. Um, and now I'm I'm feeling quite educated and confident about both both of them, Pran and DNI, because I, I I realize that our learners need both of these in our classrooms to in increase their opportunities for understanding or misunderstanding, right? For a successful communication or a miscommunication. Both of these factors, pronunciation and, and diversity and inclusion, are, are really important for that. Yeah. All right. Great. So looking at my uh, timeline, uh, I, I started teaching uh, in uh, 2010. I started teaching in drama summer camps in Italy. And I 
was still in university, so I wasn't educated about either pronunciation or diversity and inclusion. A little about diversity and inclusion, maybe, but, but not at all about pronunciation. Even though I was teaching the English language, I didn't have a lot of training in teaching language. I was doing language and drama training. Um, and in 2013, I uh, finished my undergraduate degree. I, I completed a, a TEFL course in a one-month weekend intensive. <laughs> and uh, that course didn't talk at all about DNI or pronunciation, although I was I had self-educated a bit about diversity and inclusion because I'd been at a large university with diverse people. I'd uh, worked in the uh, Student Justice Center office at the university, so I, I was more aware and open. Um, and then I, I had a a difficult first job at a school uh, in an academy for six months. And while I was there, I, I struggled a lot with teaching aspects of language. And uh, another teacher who was there who was more experienced said to me, Helen, you need to do the CELTA. You need more targeted language instruction training because you're a great teacher and a great orator and you're really good at like getting your students engaged and working, but you need to build up your language ability. And she was right. I had no idea about teaching pronunciation at that point, really. So I took the CELTA and the, for those who have taken the CELTA or a CERT TESOL or something similar, there is some discussion of pronunciation on it. Um, and uh, so then I was a bit more educated about pronunciation. And it, from 2015 to 2020, I worked in Spain, three years at an academy where I uh, was kind of the, uh, the only teacher there. And so any uh, adaptation of the course book or any effort to teach pronunciation or teach uh, diversity and inclusion in my lessons came from me and not really from, from the institution. Um, and I did a lot of self-studying with uh, massive open online courses, MOOCs online. Um, and then I spent two years working at the British Council, and there I got my TILEC, Teaching Young Learners Extension Certificate. I got mentorship support, a lot of continuous professional development, and I really became aware of, of the gaps um, that I wasn't really strong at pronunciation. And sometimes I would just skip the pronunciation part of the book. Um, because I just didn't feel confident teaching it. So I would just skip over that activity and go to a different one. Um, and, you know, and that, that's not really fair to my learners because they need pronunciation training too, right? Like everything else, it's all part of the language. Uh, and although I was really confident about diversity and inclusion, you know, extending activities, creating uh, materials when my materials weren't very inclusive, you know, for example, families were more diverse, I would create flashcards with mixed race couples or, or um, queer parents or, um, you know, things like that. And, and, you know, follow my learner's leads, talking about sports and a nine-year-old Spanish girl goes, Helen, your picture for, for football is a picture of a boy's football team, but girls can play football too. And she's right. <laughs> so, you know, making changes in that way. Uh, and then COVID-19 hit. And so I left Spain, I taught online during that time, and I started working on my Diptesol at Trinity College. And I chose the Diptesol course over the Delta because the Diptesol has a strong focus on phonology, on pronunciation. And I felt that that was a big gap in my education. Um, and over the course of the course, uh, I started to become a lot more comfortable and confident with pronunciation. And so I wanted to share that with other teachers who maybe now feel like I did years ago where I don't feel confident about this. I don't know enough about this. So I'm just going to skip it or um, I'll just do what the book says, but I'm not really sure about this. Yeah. So ooh, double click. Sorry. I noticed uh, between 2020 and now when I've been working on my diploma that in mainstream materials, there are some gaps. A lot of pronunciation activities are receptive, not productive. They're listen to this sound. Now listen to these words. Now organize them according to sound. Okay, and then what? Learners need to produce, right? They need to, to productively use the pronunciation they're learning. Um, and so I thought there was a big gap there where, where activities tended to be sort of one or two short things which were mostly receptive and, and learners won't then, weren't then applying the phonology that they were practicing. Um, also issues of diversity and inclusion. We just had an hour from Peter on this what course books mainstream materials usually look like um you know the people depicted in them are usually you know white heterosexual cisgender middle class um fairly predictable they avoid difficult topics perceived difficult topics things like that and i and i sometimes found that quite often my the learners i was teaching at the time their contacts 
their culture, their needs, wants, and goals were not reflected in these materials because they were designed for a global audience, although they really reflected a global north. But yeah, and so I started trying to fill those gaps with activity ideas, including, but not limited to, rhymes, chants, dialogues, encouraging students to produce their own work. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to show you today is these four things. That doesn't mean that's all I think you can do with pronunciation. It's just that those are easier to show on a presentation. Um, and when we're brainstorming later, I'd encourage you to think outside the box. Okay. Uh, yeah. Think about other ways we can practice pronunciation. So three types of activities. Extension. So for those who are using a course book or pre-prepared materials, we build on the activities. Like I mentioned we get introduced to some sounds or we get introduced to rising and falling intonation or we get introduced to the idea of word stress or sentence stress or connected speech. Uh, and the learners will encounter that, listen to it, identify it, write it. But then the, 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 the activity won't then go on for them to produce it, to use it. So I, I created a lot of extensions where learners could then verbalize and use and apply what they were learning. Second, inventions. When you find that your learners have a need, a particular difficulty for them in English, a particular sound that's hard for them to produce because they can't, that's, there isn't an approximate sound in, in their language or languages, they might be multilingual, um, or they have real difficulty with intonation because there isn't a lot of rising and falling intonation in, in their language or the, the languages that they speak. Um, we would, as, learn, as teachers, we create some activities to help them with those difficulties so that they can make sure that their communication is strong and there aren't misunderstandings. Yeah. And then also there's learner creations. So when we prompt learners to create their own content, their own activities, talk to them about what's difficult for them. What can we do to practice that? What kind of things can they produce and practice? Okay. So when I was started creating activities, I started trying to think about inclusion because diversity and inclusion is important to me. Um, and when we teach pronunciation, we want to make sure we're teaching it inclusively, uh, as um, you know, has been raised by Jennifer Jenkins in her Lingua Franca core, talking about a global English, English as a lingua franca, not trying to sound British or sound American <clears throat> or trying to reach some idealized native speaker sound. Is, is that what our learners really need? Do they need to interact with people in their local area? Will they need to interact with people in Europe? What, what are their specific needs? What are their communicative and immediate needs? And how can we prepare them for those phonologically? Um, uh, also, I mean, there's lots of discussion about native speakerism and accentism and, and discrimination based on, on accent. And we need to make sure that what we're teaching our learners meets exactly what their goals and needs are, right? So I created this... Uh, <laughs> dorky acronym to help me remember when I was creating activities. And as you can see, it spells the word include. Uh, and uh, I'd like to talk you through it. And I'd love for you to pop your comment in the chat. Oh, thanks, Peter. I love it too. Uh, pop your comments in the chat if uh, when I'm talking about each section, if anything springs to mind, or if you're, you're if this particular part of the um, framework really describes your learners. So first off, is the activity I'm creating interesting and interactive? We know that if our learners aren't interested, if they don't buy in, our lesson isn't going anywhere, right? We need them invested and motivated. So is it, you know, getting them interested and excited? Are they interacting? You know, are they uh, keyed into the lesson, to the activity? Uh, N, are we not only showing white and or native speakers. So we shouldn't show, just only show people of certain races. And especially if we are teaching in a country where, um, you know, not everyone is white. And I think in the global world that we live in now, diversity is everywhere. And you can find people from all places, all cultures, all backgrounds, all walks of life in a lot of places. So we want to make sure we're not only showing specific types of people and not only modeling native voices. So choosing to use um, video and audio clips of famous people from that country speaking English, because they can. There are, there are you know, famous people from every nation or public figures who speak English, and we, we can use those as models. Um, it's easiest sometimes to use ourselves and for, for teachers who are native speakers who go abroad, it's often quite easy for us to just use ourselves, but we should be presenting learners with models which represent them, 
right? Goals that they can achieve, they, people they can really look up to that they can identify with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right, Elizabeth. Uh, a lot of learners don't uh, really enjoy pronunciation. They, they might find it not important or they might not understand exactly what it's about or they might not think it's a problem or it might not impact them. If they're only ever going to speak English with locals in their area, their accent and their pronunciation doesn't matter as long as the other person understands them and they, and they are understood, right? So, yeah. Uh, we have to make sure our activities are covering different abilities and levels. So, um, oh, before I move on, uh, yeah, absolutely, Melissa. Making sure that, you know, the pron pronunciation models we're presenting are ones they can relate to, not only the ones that, uh, the, the, not only Americans and British, which kind of tends to be the two accents we hear in, in course books, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Teachers and speakers of English, it's all about our competence, right? Our proficiency, what we're able to do. It doesn't matter what accent we have. If I can understand you and you can understand me and we're communicating, then that's a successful communication in my book. Yeah. So covering different levels and, and abilities. So levels, we have to make sure that our um, activities that we're creating work for our learners' levels. Um, don't create something that's too difficult for an A1 or A2 level. Make sure that the pronunciation we're focusing on is actually um, accessible for them. Make sure that they can comprehend it, that they have enough language to understand what we're, what we're teaching them. Um, and then also abilities. If we're designing an activity with lots of movement, but we have a learner in a wheelchair in our classroom, we need to make sure that they're included and in a safe way so no one's toes are getting run over, you know, things like that. We need to make sure that everyone is included. If we have people who, you know, if we're teaching refugees or people who've experienced emotional distress recently, or some of your students have had a death in the family recently, we have to be careful about their emotional uh, states, right? And not do anything that would be like rowdy or disturbing or, or anything that touches on topics which might be triggering for them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Making sure that, um, yeah, absolutely. Accent is a part of your identity. Yeah. So why would we want to erase that and make you sound American or sound uh, uh, a British? Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. So let, next, we're listening to learner needs and goals and wants. Talk to your learners about what their needs are. Um, you know, if you're teaching a group of business English adults who intend to be communicating with people globally, then we should be focusing on a lingua franca approach, making sure that um, uh, they're, they're exposed to a variety of accents of the type that they will actually encounter in their work, right? Um, and uh, find out what they their, what they want to improve in their accent or in their in their pronunciation in their English in general. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right, Virginia. It can be really hard to keep on top of learning, and there are so many global accents and so many different varieties of English. English is really English is plural. Um, I suppose, as I say, try to keep it uh, needs based, right? Uh, making sure we're meeting our learners at the point of need, as Scott Thornbury says, you know, addressing things at the point of need, making sure that what we're teaching them does, they do need. We're not teaching them something because we feel we should or because we feel obligated to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anna, that's a good point. Accent is not a disadvantage, but a privilege. Um, it's all about, you know, intelligibility. Are we in a comfortable intelligibility? Can we understand each other? Can we be understood? And if we're not intelligible, if we can't understand, then how can we adapt to, to try to get over that communication barrier? You know, how can we adjust in the moment? Yeah, absolutely. You're right, Eugenie. And, and learners from different uh L1s, first languages, or multiple first languages, because we have a lot of bilingual, multilingual learners who come to English as a third or fourth language now. Um, you know, what uh, is their initial languages like, and how does that impact how they try to pronounce and understand English, right? So leading straight into you, understanding learner contexts. So making sure that, you know, we're showing photos of that relate to our learners' contexts, like we're not practicing, you know, Christmas, uh, if we're teaching, you know, a group of Muslim learners, they don't really need to know about Christmas. Why don't we talk about Eid? Why don't we talk about things that actually relate to them? You know, yeah, make sure that um, we're not talking about things which don't apply to them, make sure that they can relate to the material and the content. Yeah. Uh, D, very important, kind of already outlined in some of the talk in the chat. 
don't judge your learners' accents or their L1 or their previous languages. You know, um, once I was working through a lesson and the, our pronunciation focus was on H, H, H. And of course, my name is Helen. Um, but uh, in my, my group of learners, I had a, a big group of Arabic students from Saudi Arabia. And then I had one student from Guinea-Bissau in Africa. And he came from a Portuguese background and uh, he spoke, um, you know, an Af and in his language, there wasn't a huh, approximate. And so every day he was like, hello, Ellen, how are you? And that was fine. I, even though he didn't produce the huh sound, I knew exactly what he said. And when it came time to, to drilling and practicing this huh sound, um, every learner could do it except him. And we went through it. We went it once. And then I didn't bother him about it again, because I knew that putting stress on him to produce this one sound would only uh, make learning English a bad experience for him. There was no point in pressuring him about one distinct sound. There are varieties of native speakers in Britain who don't pronounce the huh in words. So why should it be any different for a non-native speaker? As long as it's not impeding communication, there's no reason for us to put pressure on learners or to judge their accents or what languages they're coming from. <laughs> yeah. So uh, finally, E, and this is the most important and has been mentioned in all four, all three of the previous webinars, empathy. We have to empathize with our learners' feelings and experiences, you know. Um, some of them may have never even practiced pronunciation before. Some of them have had years of studies in English, focusing on listening, reading, writing, and speaking, and never touched on pronunciation. Um, and so we, we need to be prepared that pronunciation might be new to them or or they might have had bad experiences in pronunciation, like I talked about in D. Uh, you know, they may have been judged or they might have had bad experiences while traveling abroad if they travel abroad or they may have interacted with uh, native speakers or international speakers who didn't understand them. So just be prepared and talk to your learners how they about their feelings and experiences. Yeah. Oh, somebody shared a great resource that I've missed. Uh, lingua franca approach. Thank you very much, Francisca. That's great. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yeah. All right. Uh, any questions about include? I want to make sure it's clear for everyone. Yeah. All right. Super. So uh, starting, let's look at uh, extensions. Okay, so this is sort of a fairly typical pronunciation activity, the purple we'd see in a book here. So listen to the sounds and words, then listen and repeat. A, uh, uncle, husband, bus, lunch. I won't go through the whole thing. Mother, son. Uh, and the learners have to listen and then listen and repeat. But that's all. So I found this quite frustrating because I wanted my learners to be able to produce the sound and practice it and, and have fun with it, actually pr do something productive. So I uh, scoped some photos from uh, Unsplash or Getty Images. You can see there, I always cite my sources, right? We don't want our students to ever um, copy. So we shouldn't either. We should always give credit where credit is due. Uh, so we can see here, I created three short rhymes. My cousin has a husband. My best friend is my brother from another mother. The couple adopted a son. And so these are just little sentences that practice the sound and uses those words and sounds in a context with a visual context to help. Um, you know, and we could adapt this for learners, have them bring out their own photos, have them create their own, uh, you know, sentences or rhymes. You can see here, this one focuses on uh, the schwa, my favorite sound in English. I, if I was going to be a phoneme, I'd want to be a, swa, a schwa because it's unstressed, right? It's never stressed. I'd like to be never stressed. So I created here something personal about me so learners could relate to it because I'm building a relationship with them, right? So my teacher's from Canada. They're North American. They use an umbrella every day in North America. It always rains in Niagara. And you can see real photos here of me and my partner, Adam, at Niagara Falls. Um, and uh, I've, I've put, you know, some maps and, and pictures for context. The three images at the bottom are from Wikipedia Commons, so fair use. Um, yeah, and so just taking uh, a group of words, uh, which the textbook has created, and creating something small for a quick and easy practice. And if we teachers are creating it, then we can make sure it's relevant and needs-based and contextualized. Yeah. Uh, additionally, here's another one. Uh, listen to the sounds and then organize the food words and then listen and check. So the, the learners have listened to 
eh, a, e. And then they look at the words and they try to organize them and think of what the sound is. And then, then they listen and check. Just listen, listen and read and, and write them in the right box. Well, okay, but when are we producing? <laughs> so I, I made this little rhyme. I ate an egg for breakfast, for lunch, some meat and bread. For dinner, peas, so healthy, and then steak ice cream. <laughs> now, obviously, if you're in a country where people don't eat steak, where they don't eat meat, for example, or, or something like that, you know, um, I only did created this based on the, the vocabulary in the book. Um, you know, put a little joke in the end, have some fun. Um, when I was teaching, I taught this in a classroom with a smart board. So this was on a Google Doc, and uh, the colors that you see on the words were not on it originally. They were only on the phonemes and we had to read through it and, and learners had to say which sound it was. Breakfast, eh, eh, Helen, it's yellow. You know, so they could identify the sound mm -hmm, and, and put it in part way through. Yeah, this one, uh, we, we listened to the sounds, ch, sh, and j. And then we, we thought about ways they could be spelled because as we know in English, spelling and pronunciation, the sounds don't always match, right? And uh, this was connected to a list of words relating to countries and nationalities. So like Germany and German, Polish and Poland, British and the UK. Yeah. Um, China and Chinese. Uh, and so I created a little conversation about one of the learners in the classroom <laughs> uh, because she conveniently had a sh in her name. So I created this little dialogue so we could practice. Where's Felicia from? She's from Poland. Oh, so she's Polish. No, she's German. But she lives in Poland. In the summer, she works there. And in the winter? Well, she visits family in China. Is she Chinese? No, remember, she's German. Oh, right. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Uh, whenever I'm trying to display uh, multiple multiple speakers, I always try to do something different. And taking my glasses on and off is a bit too fiddly. So I, I have some fake glasses that I use instead. Uh, yeah. And so I created this for my learners, about my learners. And yes, it's a bit like contrived, a bit, a bit like awkward and stunt. It's not totally, um, you know, natural and flowing, but it, it relates to them directly. And learners can then go on and create their own. And here's a rhyme I made for ch, sh, and j. My teacher lived in Scotland, but they're not Scottish. My teacher lived in Poland, but they are not Polish. My teacher lived in Germany, but they are not German. My teacher is from the UK, so they are British. And you can see there I've used my correct pronouns, they, them, for a non-binary person. And this is true. I have actually lived in all of those places, but I am British Canadian. That's my nationality. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. And again, the photos there um, from the um, Wikipedia Commons. So we don't use pictures without permission. Yeah. And you'll notice that all of these extensions I've shown you are all mostly written, right? I've made rhymes or dialogues. Don't think you're constrained to this, right? You could, if you have the technology, you could make recordings, make videos, raps, uh, like little skits, shows, presentations, drama activities, anything which gets learners producing their uh, phonology points, the part of pronunciation that they're practicing. That's fine by me. Also, you'll have noticed that all of the ones I presented focus on phoneme sounds. You can create activities to look at anything, any phonological point, right? We talked, we talked about stress and um, intonation and all sorts of things. You can practice anything, connected speech. Yeah. Okay. So now we're at the point in the, uh, oh, no, we went too far. Go back. Oh, too far. Hmm. All right. Can everybody see a slide which says extension and now you? Yeah, great, super. Uh, so this is our Mentimeter. So if you're able to go to menti.com, enter the code and put in ideas of extensions you could use in your class with your learners. What kind of activities are in the materials you use? How could you extend them to make them more productive? What could your, your learners do? Uh, so if you want to scan the QR code um, and go ahead and type, pop some things in, it should show up there on our uh, on our activity yeah 
Okay, I can see that some people are in. That's great. Sing. Yes, Ben. Absolutely. Again, if you can't access Menti, don't worry. Just type in the chat. Um, I'm just scrolling up and having a check. Um, great point, Paul. Yes, not just color, but also underlines or italicized, making sure that we are showing that difference with more than just color, just in case someone's colorblind or has color deficiency. Yeah. Um, Great. Yeah. Visual content relating to pronunciation. Yeah. Great. All right. So. All right. Let's see. How do I think color impacts learning and behavior in the inclusive classroom? Well, I think it depends on the learners. Let's see them all. Hmm. All of my answers should show. Have I only had one answer? Huh. Using instruments for stress, that's right. Great. Advice for shy teachers. Who's shy teaching pronunciation? Try, start small. Do something small, that's what I'd say. Yeah. Playing the sounds. Huh. It's very odd. You should be able to input a comment. Oh, that's all right, everyone. So just pop your ideas in the chat instead of using Mentimeter there. Yeah. Great. Using something physical to show stress, tongue twisters, role play, dancing and singing. Great ideas, everyone. Balloons and movement. Yeah. Super. Absolutely. Yeah. Using an elastic band, chain games, tongue twisters. Great, everyone. Lots of ideas. Yeah. Okay, super. Well, I think you've generated a lot of ideas, chair games. Let's move on. Some good extensions you've suggested there and keep thinking about things that you can do to add pronunciation to your classroom. Okay. Hmm. There I am. All right. Practice phonetics with looking with looking glass and proverbs and poems. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And that's great for relating to you, the culture in your area. So Next, needs analysis, point of needs. We know our learners. What pronunciation pitfalls are impeding communication for them? Uh, you know, what talk to them? What do they want to improve? If you're not really sure you, about pronunciation, I found this book uh, by Michael Swan and Bernard Smith, Learner English, A Teacher's Guide to Interference and Other Problems, really helpful because it talked, uh, each chapter was for a different language and it talked about the language distribution, its development, and then the sounds that are present in uh, and com in comparison with English. So you can see here, I've got two diagrams here and it shows which of the phonemes are, the sounds are present in Arabic and which are not. So the dark colored ones are present in Arabic and the light colored ones aren't. So we can see that in Arabic, um, only a few vowel sounds are approximately there. Whereas many more of the consonants have are similar. So we should be aware that for learners coming from um, Arabic languages, uh, they would struggle a lot with vowels and pronouncing vowels. My learners were like, Helen, ah, uh, and eh. They're the same. They sound the same to me. <laughs> so we can look at things like spelling on pronunciation, stress, intonation, assimilation problems. This book is really good for comparing what's in uh, the language of what's in English, and it gives you a really good idea of what to look for. But also observing your learners can tell you what to look for. What do they struggle with? Yeah. So when I think about what my learners needs, I can then create activities based on those needs or after they've identified needs. So like I said, my learners were like, Helen, uh, oh, eh. They're the same. They sound the same. So I made some uh, rhymes and pictures specifically for these. Uh, to compare these sounds. And I purposefully tried to pick images which were more diverse. Always when we see pictures of people doing activities like cooking or cleaning or hands, they're almost always white hands. So I tried to find <laughs> a different race and ethnicity. Uh, you can see we've got a strong doctor from Scotland. Well, why wouldn't a doctor wear a hijab? Why not? She lives in Scotland, but she's also Muslim. Hmm? Uh, you know, uh, when I originally created these activities, I had the idea of come up to London and see the sun. Uh, 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 uh. And London was one of the keywords. But we always talk about London in activities all the time. And so many learners will never go to London and aren't interested in London. Why do we always talk about London? So I changed it to Mumbai. Come up to Mumbai and see the sun. 
you know? Yeah. So it's okay to change some of the target language, adapt some of the target language if needed. Yeah. So thinking about your learners, what they need um, and, and what they want to improve, uh, write in the chat, say, uh, what do your learners need to work on? Uh, and, and what kind of activities can you create to help them work on that? Do your learners struggle with, with uh, um, word stress or sentence stress? Do they have trouble with rising and falling intonation because there, isn't, there aren't a lot of intonation changes in their language? How do you help them practice? What activities can you create? So we won't worry about uh, a Mentimeter because clearly there's something going on there. So drop your ideas in the chat. What do your learners need to work on to improve their pronunciation? Olena, and great. So Olena, think, what kind of activity can you create to help them practice? And all right, Rubina, intonation and stress. What kind of activities can you create to help them with that? Yeah, target-based le le learning, that's right. Stress, yeah, question, to, yeah, awareness of schwa, good. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So what kind of activities could you create for your learners to help them with those problems? An audio listening. Nice, Valentine. Yeah, if you find um, an, a recording which has a lot of that sound or a lot of that um, aspect of pronunciation, that phonological point in it, then you can, uh, they can listen to it. Yeah, song lyrics. Great one. Accuracy practice. Audios, listening to native speakers and imitating them. Yep, or non-native speakers, listening to proficient speakers, right? Yeah, recording themselves and listening back. Excellent. Because then you can highlight, you did this really well. Let's work on this. Yeah, it's a great way for learners to acknowledge their strengths. Yeah. Minimal pairs, playing games and lining up. Great. Well done, everyone. Lots of ideas. Listening to dialogues and practicing the same. Yeah. English videos, authentic audio materials. Yes, well done. So once you've identified what your learners needs, you can make sure that you're um, creating activities for them. So here um, is where I talk about learner creation. So I'm just watching the time, everyone. Uh, so um, when it, learners can create their own input, right? So if you have learners who are, you know, confident and capable enough and they feel well, they can take those words and create their own rhymes or their own raps or dialogues or stories or plays. Yeah, absolutely. Zor said, work with a short dialogue made by them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Differences between th and th and d and t at the end of a word. Tongue twisters. Learners can create these things themselves. You know, uh, you can see here. Uh, the textbook suggested a uh, dialogue, but the dialogues weren't really very relevant. So I just chatted with my learners. And as we talked, I wrote what they were saying. And then we went back and highlighted the sounds. And these learners I'm speaking about here, Iman, Hanan, and Hassan, were shocked at how many of the target sounds they were producing. Um, and you could do the same with, you know, practicing your intonation, make notes on what they're saying and mark where they said their intonation, and then look back. Was this, did we do it right? What can we change? What can we improve? Oh, we did it great, you know, so they can start to become aware of their own uh, pronunciation and what they can improve. Yeah, absolutely. Recording and listening after is a great one. Here I asked students, we had listened and, and written what we'd heard. Uh, and then I asked them to, to give their own examples. And a student immediately said, we're students. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> we, they were, uh, you know, and they, they, they gave real examples. You know, uh, and of course, remember, we're not only limited to learners creating texts with the uh, pronunciation they want to practice, they can record, produce videos, Uglish, Abdulaziz, nice one. I love Uglish. Uglish is a website where you can type in a, um, a phrase and then Uglish does a search and brings up uh, film and TV scenes with that phrase in it. So they can listen to different actors saying the same phrase and hear differences in different contexts. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the link about uh, uh, colorblind friendly visualizations. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing Uglish. This is the great thing about uh, this. So what prompts can you give learners to generate their own activities? What, what would you say to learners to get them to generate their own content, to create their own recordings or raps or, or dialogues? Yeah. 
listening to different regional accents, recognizing differences. Yeah, and you could do this within their own country. Um, people from different areas in their country speaking English and how their English is sound different based on where they're from. Why not? Yeah. All right, great. Well done, everyone. Yeah, listening to recordings, great. Lyrics training is another good one, yeah. And some of you might say, Helen, the thing is, I don't always have time for creating extensions or, and, and that's fair, we're all very busy. We have marking and exams and corrections and, and feedback to do, and we all have a lot of out of class work already. So what about using AI? In countries where you're allowed to use AI, I know it's banned in some places and, and some schools may not be okay with using AI to generate content, but you can give AI an instruction and have it create for you. And I had some failures, I created a rhyme that was way too long and complicated first. Second, I told it to create two stanzas, it made three. But here, this one's all right. Create a one stanza rhyme with an emphasis on the sound A. I went to the bay to play and saw a gray whale on display. It breached and splashed, making my day. What a sight. Oh, how it did sway. I mean, oh, how it did sway is not very colloquial. I would say, what a sight. It, what a sight. Um, it made my day. What a sight. Uh, watching it, it play. Something like that. Yeah. It's, it's okay to fix the things that uh, AI creates for you. You know, and here you, you can see that I uh, asked it to create multiple sounds using A and I. The bright display caught my eye. The fireworks lit up the sky. I couldn't help but feel so high and for a moment forget my why. Forget my why means forget my problems. This is quite complicated. This is sort of C1 level or C2. Or C2. You know, I would change that to, and for a moment I could fly. Yeah, why not? Yeah, twee.com. That's a tool I don't know. Thank you, Abdulaziz, for the suggestion. And also remember, it's not just rhymes. We can generate dialogues. We can generate any kind of text on AI. And this would have this, and this really helps us instead of spending 10, 15 minutes writing something, you can have AI write it for you and then go back and tweak and fix the little bits that you need to change. Yeah. Role playing. Yeah, that's a great idea. Absolutely. You're right, Anna. We have to make sure that our um our uh everything is targeted to our learners, that it's not too difficult for them. Yeah? Okay. Equally, you might say that you never have enough time and lessons for learners to generate content. They can generate it with AI, right? Give them the parameters, the criteria, and ask them to generate a poem or uh, a dialogue. And then they can go in and edit it. And, and that process of workshopping, presenting, demonstrating, practicing, editing, changing, all of those it's all productive. They're using the language and texts that are created and adapted by them are more meaningful to them, right? Yeah, so we rushed through that. Well done. And this has been really active. Q&A, go. <laughs> Hi. Well, uh, thanks, Helen. Uh, I'll, I'll yeah. help you with the, the Q&A area. We have uh, lots and lots and lots of comments in the chat about all these different tools and mm -hmm. everyone's cool activities. And yeah, I see as we go through the q and I'm going to blip through my reference slides so people can take screenshots or make notes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Great. And we'll also and you've also produced a handout for everyone. Yeah, well, haven't course, you? Yeah. So yeah. one of our moderators will share that in the chat. And that's got some things that um, you can use when you're creating a pronunciation mm -hmm. exercises. So, um, yeah, let's get to the Q&A. Have you seen any questions that you think are interesting, Helen? Let me bring or... them up. I've got three here. I live in India. People expect me to speak in a British accent, but I follow American pronunciation. And people who are unaware always try to troll me for it, how to deal with it. Oh, that is a big challenge, Manisha. Um, I mean, the reality is that we, English is a global language now, and all accents of English are valid and important. Your Indian accent when you pronounce English is also valid and, and important. And I can understand, you know, so the way I would say is, um, that you are trying to prepare your students to understand a variety of accents, not only British, but also American. Um, because with technology nowadays, students from India might meet and speak to Americans and they need to be able to understand them. So why not? That's yeah. what I'd say. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's about that's about being inclusive, right? We yeah. want to know who our students' audience is going to be, who they're going to listen to, who mm -hmm. they're going to talk to, and then adapt it accordingly. I've written down like adapt um, and learn about our students' needs lots of times in my notes when I've been listening to you. <laughs> Great, yeah. Um, um, there's a question from um, Peter, one of our presenters, which is one that I wanted <laughs> to ask as well. What um, aspects of pronunciation do you most enjoy teaching? I mean, you've got lots of poems, lots of chants. Yeah. Is that something you really like or is there well, something? I have I do have a background in, in drama and so I, I do like orations but I mean when it comes to teaching phonological points like teaching vowel sounds or consonant sounds or intonation or um, teaching uh, word stress versus sentence stress or connected speech the reality is that I enjoy teaching what my students want to learn what they're engaged with what they're excited about if they're excited then I'm excited about it if if they want to meet if they want to meet to create an activity for them or to co-create an activity which is about intonation or about sentence stress or about assimilation when we speak fast and sounds disappear then I would happily create an activity about that so yeah I suppose it's about as a teacher not only motivating your students, but motivating yourself, feeling excited about what we're presenting with and working on with them. Yeah. That that maybe answers the next question that I, I took from the chat a long time oh. ago. And, and it was a teacher that said um, something like, how can I teach pronunciation because I'm shy about pronunciation. And I think yeah. some teachers feel like that, but you, yeah. you're saying just, um, you're an actor, right? You're, yeah. you're, you're not, you're not you, you can motivate by, by being the actor on stage and asking the students yeah. to if it helps any other you, advice. If it helps you to think about the, the teacher you as a separate you, like if you don't want to lose face by making mm -hmm. a mistake, um, then, then, then there's teacher you and then there's you. But also, I would say embrace the mistakes. If you make a mistake, then say, oh, no, that was wrong. Teachers are human too. We make mistakes too. I'm learning just like you. Um, I used to talk to my students about going to conferences and attending webinars and telling them that, you know, I'm studying, to, I'm practicing to improve as a teacher too. So it's all part of the process. And I would say, don't be afraid of the fact that you're learning just like they are. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning, even as I'm presenting a webinar, I've got great ideas out of the chat today. Yeah, that's one of the nice things about these webinars where everyone shares, right? I've, mm -hmm. I've learned about a really great website that someone shared, the one where you, I've forgotten it, the one where you can type into YouTube and find different accents. Youglish. Youglish. Yeah, I'm going to use that. That's yeah. amazing. It's a shame we can't save the chat. <laughs> well, uh, we, we, when, when we send everyone the links, maybe we'll put some of those in. Great. In the links, that sounds good. Yeah. So I'll go back to something you said. Right at the Oops. start, you said you were mm -hmm. um, self-educating a lot to find out mm -hmm. about pronunciation. Um, how can people self-educate about pronunciation? Have you got any tips of places they can go? Well, oh. here is for the teachers who like to get involved in a professional learning community who have access to the internet and do communicate with other teachers online. Here are some people you can follow on social media. Uh, Mark Hancock does a lot on pronunciation. Uh, Taylor Viegia as well, a ton. Two people to really follow if you're focused on pronunciation. If you're interested in diversity and inclusion, uh, Lottie Galpin is someone to go to. Um, and then Tyson Seaburn, who wrote the book how to write inclusive materials so definitely one to check out um peter j fulliger of course who uh we saw in a previous session who works on creative inclusive materials and ashley r moore who uh talked a lot about different types of inclusion uh which i didn't touch on so much in this presentation because peter did so <laughs> i didn't want to get too far into it but yeah these are, if you want to have some things in your feed when you go online there's some people uh also as i say that reading practicing speaking to others those are all the the ways that we improve it, it you know it took me a couple of years to build up until the point where i felt confident to do this presentation so <laughs> if you're just starting to focus on it don't worry ah uh, yes elizabeth good point mark and taylor who i mentioned mark hancock and taylor viegia they run a pronunciation course for teachers on teaching pronunciation so if you feel you would benefit from learning about ways to teach pronunciation they have a course on um, yeah, and also you can follow me on social media as well. I, I'm I'm on Twitter and Instagram and and Facebook. I'm Helen teaches ENG. Helen teaches English. So, yeah, great. Well, we all start you. somewhere. Thank you so much. And like your T-shirt says, just uh, keep on learning. Yeah, Don't... never stop learning. <laughs>
So um, thanks everyone who's come today. I know lots of people have come to four of our webinars on conclusion. That's incredible. We started um, the, the, the morning for, for us here in, in Europe talking about inclusion in general, then refugees, then LGTB. QIA plus issues and then inclusion brought it all together with pronunciation. I've had a really good time. I hope everyone else has had a great time. Thanks for all the moderators on social media. Thanks to all the presenters that have come today and uh, big thanks to um, everyone who's joined and participated. So have a great evening and we'll see you on July the 13th to talk about ICT in education. But a big thanks uh, last of all to, well, to Helen. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Take care. Thanks for coming. Goodbye. Yeah,